It's back. Finger food wrenched from obscurity. A snack that has its own subculture and one with legends. We changed the version of Roti John back in New York City. The food of foragers emerges from hiding. It's time to come back. <laughs> food from the streets became a country's pride. The humble, the simple, the complex, the unusual. They fed the good times and the bad. Here at the table are the stories of the people who lined the belly of a nation. He's done it probably a hundred times before, and he's doing it again, back to the bazaar with renewed vigour. We are actually at Suntech City for select fest. Uh, as you can see at the back, my team is actually fixing the booth. So today we're actually doing something different. Today we actually serve a wide range of varieties like uh, our burgers, roti john and drinks. Yes, you heard right. Roti john. We first met him, the man, not the bread, a million black buns ago. He was one of the early ones to launch hamburgers from a hawker centre. One stall became two, and so on. A lot have changed throughout these years. Um, so we actually launched in New York City. Currently, if I include uh, New York City, we actually have six Ashes Burnett Outlet. His New York story will be told in good time. The Roti John, however, can't wait. Roti John is Singapore-born. Remember that. It was created in the post-war years when British service personnel were omnipresent. The locals referred to the Caucasian male as Mat Saleh or Ang Mo or Mr. John. It's said that once a Mr. John wanted a hamburger, most folks in 50 Singapore had no idea what that was. Huh? Mr. John described it to a hawker, presumably a roti or bread seller, who concocted something with soft French loaf, also known as tiam tao roti in Hokkien. In goes minced mutton, peas, tomatoes and eggs. Voila, the white guy's sandwich or roti john. That is one version of the story. Roti John is uh, something like our street subway. Basically, a traditional Roti John, you will always have uh, an egg omelette and a minced meat mixed inside a bowl. We'll whisk it, put it on a hot plate, then lie the hoggy roll flat, uh, or baguette, I would say, uh, on eggs. So it will stick together. Then after that, usually we'll just put some vegetables, your chilli sauce, mayonnaise. So that's a traditional uh, Roti John. Roti John went through many creative iterations, with the current benchmark set in the 70s by a hawker in Taman Serasi, opposite the Botanic Gardens. A former hawker neighbour remembers. Very simple one, the Roti John, not the modern, modern one, not modern one. Very simple Roti John, only egg and chilli. They yeah, use chilli bowl. Chilli bowl, uh, use the garlic, and then the egg. Today, that Taman Serasi version has disappeared. But the dish lives on in free form. It has all kinds of stuffing, dressed in all kinds of sauces, loaded with cheese, onions and mayo. It's a Tiam Tao Loti on steroids. So in New York, we actually do a modern version. We will still have the omelette, you know, but we actually separated the, the minced meat. So we actually mix the beef with cheese, then uh, put in our signature sauce, a bit of slaw. So uh, we changed the version of Roti John back in New York City. So I thought, why not let's do an ashes version of uh, Roti John here in Singapore as well. No one in Singapore is actually doing charcoal Roti John. Bazaars are the perfect taste beds for new, unusual and rarely seen food items. 
The original Persian word became the Malay Pasa, or local Chinese Pasa. Regardless of race, language or religion, food was and still is prominent in bazaars. At a simpler time, even before expensive rentals, the bazaar was known as Pasamalam. Entire streets, some miles long, would be lit by the kerosene lamps of hawkers as they peddled their goods and their food. During festive months, Pasamalams provided roving hawkers with bonus business opportunities. And it was the Pasamalam that fed Stefan's family for many years. So we actually came from the, this Ramadan bazaar here. Yeah. I remember that you know my father would set up table and then we were helping to sell. All illegal. My name is Stefan Surya. My name is Jamna Rani. I'm 34. I sell body. They call it as Vade. Uh, uh, that is uh, spoken Tamil. And then uh, written Tamil is Vade. So that's why when you see my uh, spelling, it's Vade. So Malays call it Vade. So there's few people call it differently. Chinese call it Vadai. So they literally pronounce what is what they say. Vade came from India and was originally sold in Singapore by Tamil hawkers alongside other snacks like muruku. These were made from lentil flour or ulundu in Tamil with no prawns in sight. These were homemade and sometimes sold in the streets, sometimes by the kids. My mother always make the vade. They sell Jalam Stadium, last time got stadium football all, they go and sell, my sister, my brothers all. Later, after I married, first first I start temples, just sell la, plain vade. It is a mystery how the prawn eventually got involved. Maybe the original was too plain for local taste buds. Crustacean fritters are abound in Singapore cuisine, like the Hokkien He Pia, where prawns are added for the oomph. And for the incredible likeness of being, self-raising wheat flour is used in the batter. And this is what Rani did. She swapped the heavier lentil flour with a lighter wheat flour mix and embedded a prawn. It's sold. I just use my own recipe to do. Then people like to buy. I sell the prawn wadi and the dal wadi only. These two items only last time, in 1999, five piece, two dollars only. My father actually taught me, so it was like something like EA Goka, Goyen and Kok. So uh, that was uh, one thing that I learned now, uh, young time. Malay is. Uh... Oh, suddenly I forgot. <laughs> Lima do dollar. Traditional Tamil vades are eaten with a sambar or chutney, but the Singapore vade is eaten on the move with a sidekick. My father thought it's, it's a bit difficult, you know, huh? who is going to make the chilli sauce? That's how he you know, introduced eating with green chilli. And so, the Singapore vade took shape and form. It's fluffy inside, a prawn on top and green chilli on the side. And this is what Rani sold with her family assisting during Ramadan at the Gelang Serai Pasamalam. My sisters, my brother, all will be helping you. Then I'll be running around. I, I'm, I was the youngest. So last time there was some construction going on at this this area. So my father actually go and set up a place for my mom to cook. So me, my brother, all will come time to time to go and collect the body and then transport over to the other side at the traffic light area. So it was. At this place, we will be selling in those mahjong tables, uh, just set up here. So that's why it's, it's really a nostalgic feeling. Uh. So yeah, as you can see there, that is where I go and put my flag there. People ask me, why you're, you're already famous in Juchet, why you go and put there? I say, never mind, uh, I, I, I still want to be there. I always think one day my wadi must be there. And today you can see that there. It's especially poignant because in his teens, his family went through incredibly hard times. My father passed away when I was 16 years old. Rani became the sole breadwinner and sold Vade to make ends meet. Her community didn't approve. Community looked down. Oh, they asked me also, why you work here? You can make money or not? They look us low standard like that. They go to school also, they all 
Oh, you sell what they are. They look down at them also, the, my children. They also feel hurt also. Then after Surya also, probably not enough money to give also. So I decided to quit, join her in the business. Theirs was primarily a pop-up business until a cataclysmic event forced them into permanency. All the bazaars are cancelled, 2020. And then, um, that is when my brother actually uh, reminded me, because I actually had a hawker stall that I actually tended very cheap for about $500. I still remember the days. Then I posted on Facebook. I announced, and then the crowd just started to kick in. That's my turning point. Uh. Uh, it was really my turning point. From one to two to many, Vade is now readily available in several branches and pop-ups throughout Singapore. Even with a staff of 40, Stefan is still pretty much hands-on. When you wait for operation, don't need la. Want to buy for me kueh? For Hari Raya, want to buy for me kueh? Don't need, don't need. The menu has expanded to include other humble, often disrespected food items like chicken skin, gizzard backsides, discards that turn a fortune and keep almost every member of the family in the business. Ganga is uh, in charge of all the Instagram, the Facebook, all. Surya and the Joshua also got shops. So these four children, I never go the wrong way. I'm so happy. Now, at least now is there. Everybody is okay, okay. Today, the business crosses another milestone. The opening of the 11th branch out in the east. So the downside of expansion, however, are more problems that need solving. Still functioning in the one-man operation mode, Stefan is Mr. Fix-It. He has a very big problem at the moment. His one and only flour mixing machine has broken down. I can mix about 100 kilos of flour one time. I have few ingredients that I put together. They're all in different uh, weight or uh, volumes. The flour mixture is a secret formula known only to mother and son. The just-add-water ready mix is then dispatched to different branches to be used on call. So now I've got this problem, it's, it's, it's not working. If this breaks down, then I need plan B, manual again. Yeah, so I already ordered another machine, but it's still on its way. I don't know whether the... Photo have problem. I need to ask the technician to come and open. My father is a mechanic. I mean, he, he repairs things at home. Uh, if my father around, I don't need to worry. I just tell him, help me fix. Invoking the spirit of his father, Stefan hits on a possible solution. Okay, I think we, we try with the new socket. Uh. I think it should work because my staff actually panic. They say the machine is not working out. Uh, so I also start to panic. So we, 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 we will try with the new shocker. Let's go. Okay. Should work now. I was worried, I was worried because need to mix 700 kg of flour. No joke, I have to go back to manual. I think it's the power. So 
So let's one hit it. Next challenge. Hawkers today rely on industrial machines to keep going. One hawker has kept his going for half a century, creating another humble Singapore snack, the curry pop. Singapore is a multicultural curry puff society where identities are defined by pastry, stuffing, crimping and cooking. In the 50s, the gold standard was the genteel puff pastry version filled with a mild chicken curry and baked. These were chichi snacks sold with chicken pies and Swiss rolls. The gali pop or gali pop is a local rendition of the puff. The pastry is buttery, not baked, but fried. The filling includes a bit of egg with potatoes and or chicken. This part of town used to be known as Kalipok Ro. This style is now the national default. The epok epok is in a class of its own. The pastry has no butter, only oil and salt. Instead of curry, the stuffing is spiced paste sardines or potatoes. It's fried to produce a thin, crispy, bubbly skin. To call it a Malay curry puff is just disrespectful. Then there is the curry puff, the Indian Muslim version. Pastry interwoven with margarine is stretched to resemble phyllo. The stuffing is spiced potato or minced mutton, then baked, best eaten with teh tarik on the side. A relatively newcomer is the crispy spiral curry puff, made with two kinds of dough and then deep fried. The usual stuffing is curry potato and chicken. Those dots are local code for the stuffing inside. Green for potatoes, red for sardines. The system evolves with more complex combinations. Finally, the edge. Should it be roped, pinched or nyap, squeezed or just let alone? Regardless of styles, the local curry puff has become big business for some. For others, however, it's still a means of getting by. Mr Chua is the maker of old-school curry puffs known locally as Kalipok or Kalipok. Customers have a lot of choices, as long as they pick curry potatoes with chicken. The usually solitary Mr Chua has an assistant today. The first task is to prepare the filling or liao. It's mostly onions and potatoes. His stall is a time capsule of machines past and most of the equipment came with him when he moved here about 50 years ago. The originally named East Coast Food Center, completed in the late 70s, was built on reclaimed land and is the only one in Singapore that's by the beach. The crowd comes in with the evening breeze, so no one disturbs him at lunchtime. Before he settled into the hawker centre, Mr Chua sold in the streets, in and out of Katong's main thoroughfare, East Coast Road. 
一辆三轮车，就是这样一个摊位这样。因为我从我弟弟那边学过借借手，以前那些馅料全部是在在家里做，以前可以。这都我从我五十几年了，来的 sixty eight。And for a half century, the Kuali has cooked the same set of ingredients. First, fry off the aromatics. Garlic, ginger, lemongrass, onions. Next, the curry powder, which is his own concoction. In the days before pre-packaged spices or food processors, cooks turned to spice merchants. Once fragrant, the curry mix or rumpa is taken out. In goes the potatoes to be steamed. Each potato cube must remain intact, and once they are three quarters cooked, the rumpa goes back in for the final mix. This batch of liao will serve Mr. Chua's needs for the next three or four days. He, on the other hand, has been serving Katong's curry puff needs for generations. A little housekeeping before pastry making. The machines haven't suffered under Mr. Chua's meticulous care and protection. The same goes for his recipe. This recipe is why my friend is the first one to do the recipe. The recipe is the first one to do the recipe. I'm going 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 to do the recipe. A short crust pastry is made from wheat flour with shortening rubbed in. Margarine, you know, margarine, I baking powder, I hot. Yeah, do I pang yam bo be yam pang? Eh, chui jiu shi yam chui lai pang liao jiu. Then I da na ge fen ya shang lai jiu ke yi zuo. It's an old cognac bottle, in case you're interested. Preferred because of its long neck. The chicken mix, which Mr. Chua cooked earlier, is filled separately from the potatoes. The package is sealed with a pinching technique called rope, and some judge the quality of a curry puff by the light crispiness of this edging. He doesn't make them all at once, but on the go, to keep them crispy outside, fluffy and luscious inside. For many hawkers of his generation, Mr. Chua turned to food because of dire circumstances. The liao will be used over the next few days. Today had been an exception. He had company. Usually, Mr. Chua is on his own. There's no one to bear the torch. I was still better. 
By tea time, Mr Chua is ready for business, which will survive as long as he can. While not many hawkers now make this kind of katong curry pop, another type is coming back with a vengeance. It's so good, they named it twice. Epok, epok. As though you didn't know, Singapore's early independent days were dire. The majority relied on the government for work because there were few enterprises and the multinational companies had yet to come. Many people turned to food, cooking at home, selling in the streets. This is how the Epoch Epoch got around. Since that time, the Epo Epo has become bigger and bulkier, at least for this father and son team. My name is Muhammad Noor Shambhidin bin Rashikin. I'm 28 years old this year and I'm selling curry puff at Godama Food Centre. So I have a nickname, Bobo. My name is Muhammad Rudi bin Madun. My nickname is Max. I'm 47 this year. I'm selling curry puff only at Godama Food Centre. Their epok epok are larger than the standard with plenty of choices. And their plans are just as ambitious. Everything I do, I do to the max. Even people order from me also, they order to the max. That's why I put my nickname Max. <laughs> Auntie, hello, morning. Epok epok isn't like the kalipok. Epok it was a Malay traditional kuih. It has a thin, crispy crust and a spicy filling of either potatoes or sardines. Freshly handmade ones are hard to come by, and that's why it has become the sole focus for Max and Son. I concentrate more on epok epok. Uh, only that we have a variety of epok epok. We have uh, potato, we have the sardine, we have the beef, beef rendang, we have chicken, and we have also the veggie. Veggie was the old time favorite for the old guys. La. That's it, I try. They asked my mom to teach me, so I said, one more work paper I want to put. So I said, okay, I want to try rendang. Oi, then rendang also hot favorite from here. His day has many starting points. At seven in the morning, he hits on the eggs. Okay, before I boil it, I put some of the salt to make it uh, much more easier to peel off. Lah. Okay. Hard boiled eggs aren't a traditional ingredient in Epo Epo. But if it works, do it. I put, a, put an egg, or both curry, potato curry, egg, uh, sardine egg. The fillings, known in Malay as inti, are made in the quiet of the afternoon of the previous day. First, potato, which has been pre-cooked. So has the spice paste, or rempa, which was made in bulk. Unlike the kalipok, the potato filling is more mashed. But you get the crunch of onions and fresh chilli in the sardine filling. The canned fish is rinsed off its sauce and flicked into the onion chilli mix and finished with a rumpa that's made of chilli, garlic and tamarind. Regardless of fillings, the pastry is the same. Unlike the kalipok, there is no butter or margarine mixed into the wheat flour. Because butter is make it uh, too soft. No butter, no margarine. It's purely traditional. Uh, normal wheat flour and a bit of oil to make it uh, much more smooth. From the dough, we use flour, oil, cold water and also salt. I put inside one basin, then I mix it all together and then become a perfect dough. The recipe come from my grandfather, late grandfather. Mr. Mama Bakri, she's the one who teach me how to do it. A low-cost mold puts everything together. Because pinch take time. I did for me now we use the mold easier. Once put the filling, put the water a bit, pop, ready to, to go ready. Epo Epoch's edging isn't roped, but flattened to produce crispiness to the max. 
There is an unwritten rule in Singapore about the curry puff colour coding. It probably began with the epo epo to distinguish its original two flavours. The code for the colouring is green is always for potato egg. Okay. Red is for sardine. For sardine egg, I put a cross to differentiate what the colour look like. As for rendang, I put an X. For the curry chicken, I put a two bar of uh, green colour. The creative coding will continue as long as he keeps expanding his menu. As for the business future, Max has only one choice, Hisham. I have only one children, that is Hisham. I've been helping me a lot uh, in the recent years. Uh. Since secondary school, I like to cook with him. And he has said to me, I have interest on this. I said, Ken, if you have interest on this, maybe you take over the shop, I'll open another shop of my own. I said, no problem, give you a chance to learn more about business. The team settled here at Golden Mile Hawker Centre three years ago, having moved from their original rental from an old coffee shop. My first store is at Block 10, the old coffee shop there. Been here, been there for about five years. Then eventually we said that, OK, lah, we want to be our own, our own boss, our own store. This coming August, we're opening another shop. Everywhere, people trying to sell paper. That's why I told my son, this time uh, challenging for us. So don't drop the standard. In recent years, hawker centres have become a launching pad for single humble dishes, but equally a place to profile more obscure food, like a dish that came out of foraging. There's a new bird in town. The jungle fowl is native to Singapore, once vanishing, but recently returned to the folds of the city. This one greets a family of hawkers as they arrive at their stalls in the CBD. The Wahids have been running a traditional nasi padang stall for many decades. But one of them recently brought something new to the table. My name is Abdul Wahid. Uh, we sell nasi padang and Malay food. Uh, so. Hi, I'm Nur Shakira binti Abdul Wahid. I'm turning 40 this year. And I sell ayam bakar, ayam penyek and nasi lemak. I've been doing it for five years now. My name is Hamida. And now my age is 71. I sell rice. Rice uh, Indonesia style. Okay, my name is Reda Baika binti Abdul Wahid. I'm 42 years old now. <laughs> and I'm selling nasi ulam or specialised in nasi ulam with ayam pecik. Nasi ulam. It's seldom heard of and never ever sold in hawker centres. When I first started, everyone thought it was a Western dish that I made up. <laughs> so even today, my friends think that, oh, you mean it's a traditional Malay dish? Reda's stall, which she currently shares with her sister Kira, is next to their parents. The signages reflect generational tastes in branding. In English, it's called warung. In Malay, it's called kedai. Kedai, kedai, or something like that. Asik pasangan means lovely lah. Nice, lovely. In Malay, means lovely, yeah. Nice. The Little Red Hand? Oh, that's an ode to my dad. He'll read this kid's children's book called The Little Red Hand. Uh, it's a nice um, moral in the story. Uh, this one, well, hand ends up doing everything even though she lives in a house full of people. No one bothers to help her. So in the end, she's like this one-woman show. And as soon as she, I think the end of the story was that as soon as she bakes a cake, everyone wants it. No worries for this family. The proximity allows for easy passage of ingredients and even the trade. Kira, the youngest, was the first to be roped into the business. What is that, huh? I asked my children to combine me. Don't work. Honestly, don't worry your work. Come to business. I say business is very good. So I helped out my mind her shop for, say, two years. And from there, I picked up the business. For the longest time, and they kept asking me to join them. I'm like, no, no, no. Like, I wasn't, I didn't feel I was ready or prepared for it. 
Zahara herself learned to cook from her own mother when she took over the Taman Serasi stall in the 70s. This thing, huh? Like my, like my own property, small property, uh, maksud, my, I mean, uh, because I cannot get any more this one. I, I think my age is around 40, 47. That time I in Botanical Garden, Hawker Centre, Taman Seras. Yes, I know I did, they all come, suddenly they all come and take my photo, never arrange. Never rent. I said, I thought, okay, go ahead. So the business at Taman Serasi was so good that they managed to, you know, my humble, my parents from humble background, just hawkers, managed to send me off to school in Canada, my sister in England. These children all studied all overseas. Right? All my money, all invested to them. <laughs> it wasn't all losers, because shortly after that, Taman Serasi closed up. Then they had another shop at Shenton Way or Raffles Place, who caught also. Rent was also high, so that kind of like um, created a financial, huge financial losses for my dad. So I decided that, you know, I didn't want anyone to struggle anymore. So I cut short my studies and came back and started working. And I did a couple of jobs here and there. Digital marketing for them. I guess I was working all time zones, actually. So I was easily working up to, say, 12 to 18 hours, sometimes in the weekends. 24 hours. I have to carry the laptop everywhere. Even Hari Raya, I have to carry the work. laptop. <laughs> and I was close to getting burnt out. So I decided that, okay, maybe it's time. And it was during the pandemic as well. One day she told me she was looking for a kitchen. I said, what for? I want to sell my own recipe. Yeah, I want to do my own recipe. I want to promote my own uh, recipe dishes. I should have our own salt. There are various rental schemes in a government-run hawker centre. Under the tendered and market rates system, stall owners are allowed to sublet. And here, the family got lucky. They are teach stall their owner. They don't have to give up the stall. They don't to the NEA. So, OK, I take over the stall. I pay the rent and everything. OK, just for her. I, all the capital, all I do, uh, I come up for her. I design everything for her. And so, Reda entered the folds of the hawker trade. Morning, Daddy. Good. Where are my herbs? Oh, herbs, yeah, in fact. Morning, Mommy. Is my chicken out already? It's in the fridge? supposed to understand your eye language. <laughs> like, I'm more conservative than she is. She's more adventurous and more sporty. Maybe because I'm married with, and I'm a mom, so I have to like portray myself more like an adult than she is, who is so free, free her own world, I'll say, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, mommy. I'm the only two star who with the world. I've got two sisters, she's the only mummy. And she takes care of me too, she's my mummy. It's only been a year since she started selling this ancient dish. Roughly translated as salad, ulam reflects the indigenous foraging cultures of our region, where pepper leaf, torch ginger and lemongrass grew freely in home gardens or in the wild. Today, it's seldom cooked because of the work involved. <sighs> so, the nasi ulam is a very laborious dish because each the herbs needs to be and the ingredients need to be chopped and hand chopped, hand sliced. Uh, where's my herbs, my chicken? Uh, I use up to 15 ingredients, sometimes 17, depending on the price of the herbs. If the price, say, it's rainy season, then everything goes much higher, then I reduce certain things. First, we gave her like, some ideas of what to sell, but she is so headstrong what she really wants, and she just goes for it. So we just let her be 
eventually it's a success. Her idea went through. The ingredients uh, itself is not really a secret. It's just a matter of how you balance everything. So my key ingredient um, when mixing the rice is lemongrass. You need the rice to cool a bit because the herbs can be added in when it's too hot. Then it will cook and then it will taste bitter or very different. Technically, it's supposed to be a rice salad, but Singaporeans are not used to having cold rice. So I improvised this for them. So I guess you can call this a Singaporean version of nasi udang. Nasi ulam's most spectacular looking cousin is Kelantan's nasi garabu where the rice, tinted blue with blue pea flour, is usually paired with a charcoal-grilled ayam pechik. Ayam pechik also, so I wanted um, to complement the nutritious um, nasi ulam. I wanted something a bit more rich, but at the same time, healthy. Reda's version starts with whole legs of chicken that are lightly poached in water, laced with coconut milk. The coconut milk just to tenderize it. Coconut milk activates meat enzymes that break down proteins, thus tenderizing and flavoring the meat at the same time. So uh, I just pop the chicken into the grill for the first time. It needs to go into the grill twice. So the first time is to further tenderize it and not overcooking it on the uh, boiling water. There's a rempa or spice paste that's added to the chicken. It's with the neighbor. Okay, thank you, Ali. Yeah, I get help from my neighbour to pour my, <laughs> my frozen rumpa. So we blend our rumpa in salt. Like I blend it for a whole week. So I do it in batches. So my fridge is super cold somehow, so it got frozen. Uh, so yeah, so quick fix is to put boiling water in. So it quick fast and neighbour has that. So. The rumpa is used to create a thick marinade into which the lightly grilled chicken will simmer for a while. This is an important step as it determines the final taste profile of the dish. But it's tricky during Ramadan. Um, we have our neighbours. If they're not passing, we ask them for help. Or we have our regular customers who come who are like willing to try the food for us, to be our tasters. Ah, better. Thank you. <laughs> My Ramadan taste tester. <laughs> Pachik means splashing, which the chicken gets before the final grilling. I'm glazing my chicken with chilli before I pop it into the grill. That's cause it'll give this um, nice hint of colour. Okay, done. Rain brings little reprieve as it means business might be affected, especially if it becomes a long-winded downpour. But a fan arrives. Hi, Jackson! <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Thanks for coming in the rain. Yeah. Oh, wow, here's my unofficial intern. It's a New Yorker who came to Singapore on a Fulbright scholarship. Uh, and he was started off as a customer at my shop, but his thesis was to write about the history or the hawker culture in Singapore. So I wanted to refresh my memory on what herbs go into the nasi. Good timing. I just did that. Really? <laughs> um, I also fed him my nasi now, which love, and then he got more curious about it instead of asking more about what goes into it. Today, he decided to base his project on his nasi love and how it stems from a foraging culture. Nice when your customers end up as friends. It's an unwritten rule that Mondays are rest days for hawkers in Singapore, not for the Abdul Wahids. It's another manic Monday. Satisfaction is there when people enjoy our food. You know? The satisfaction is there. If you don't think all what my customers consider like, like, like friends already, very close. And we love them, man. They too love our food.
Today, they are not cooking for customers. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Come in. <laughs> Their festive spread includes a lot of labor-intensive dishes. Absent is the nasi ulam. Okay, so we got around, around right? Okay. <laughs> um, uh, ayam sambal, which is chicken in like sweet black sauce, and this is actually a whole salad dish. So this is gado gado. At the get together, Reda has some explaining to do. My stall is good. A year after she successfully launched her nasi ulam business, Reda decided to step away, causing the family to rejuggle. But this is a story to be continued in the belly of a nation.